Well, welcome to 700 Club Canada. It's great to have Holly Taylor with us all week this week. Great yes. to have you here. It's been awesome. Some incredible stories. Incredible stories and stories of people that have been set free from many people that are struggling with addiction. Mm -hmm. I'm sure in your ministry on radio ministry, you yeah. hear those stories too. Absolutely. It's incredible how people just call. They're going through a rough spell and they might not even believe, but they to sense something different about what they're hearing on the airwaves. So wow, they call. Cool. Well, you know what? They call us too, our 24 7 prayer line. And I think that's the key to freedom is calling out for help, right? Yeah, so important. If you don't come to the end of yourself where you realize you actually need help, mm -hmm. then you can't find the freedom you need. Yeah, you have to ask. Yeah, you have to ask. So pay attention. Today's show, you're going to be really encouraged by the amazing stories of freedom from addiction that you're going to see. And now Jocelyn's life is proof that no matter what you've done, God provides the opportunity to start again. On October 3rd of 1995, he was headed home to watch me cheer for a homecoming game and he never made it home. I was very mad at God that he would take someone that was so good to me out of my life who I needed. Jocelyn James had been living with her uncle Wade when a car accident took his life. He had given her safe shelter from her father, an abusive alcoholic. When he would whip me with the belt, I felt just helpless and I mean, like it hurt so bad that like, I just wanted him, I wanted him dead. More than giving Jocelyn an escape, her uncle showed her something her father never could. I longed for someone's love, because I would see families out with their, their mom and their dad, and, and I just didn't have that. He was a godly man, and he just loved me. With her uncle and his love gone, Jocelyn fell into a deep depression. At 16, the once popular cheerleader and A-plus student quit high school and started partying and drinking. I didn't care about life. I didn't care about anyone. I was just mad. I was hurt, and I knew when I drank that I didn't feel any of that. By the time Jocelyn was in her early 20s, she was married, working at a manufacturing plant, and using meth. The only times she stopped were the three times she got pregnant, all which ended in miscarriages. It hurt my heart more than it hurt me. I didn't know if there was something wrong with me, if there was something wrong with him, um, or if it was just God. Two years later, there was a bright spot. Jocelyn would give birth to a daughter and three years later to a son. By this time, she and her husband divorced and she had gone back to using meth. Then, during a routine checkup, doctors discovered she had ovarian cancer. While it took six surgeries to remove the cancer, it also put her back on the path to addiction, this time to prescription painkillers. It completely changed my life. It literally numbed everything in me. When the prescription stopped, she started getting opiates from people at work. Over the next five years, she would fall deep into addiction, going from pills to shooting up 16 times a day. Opiates like takes full control of your whole body, like your mind, your body, your, your, your soul. Over the years, Jocelyn would lose everything except her children. She was arrested numerous times as she resorted to selling drugs and stealing to support her habit. By 2012, the ravages of addiction had taken over as she now weighed a mere 95 pounds. Still, she was in denial. I'd lost all self-respect, respect for anyone else. I went from being an, a functioning addict to someone who couldn't even, couldn't even wake up if, if they didn't have their fix the next morning. In November of that year, with nowhere to turn, she and her children moved in with her ex-husband. She was watching the news one night when her picture came up as Franklin County's Most Wanted. I was tired, I was over it, I was sick of living that life. The next day, she turned herself in and was eventually found guilty of a number of crimes, including forgery and drug dealing. She would serve six months of a possible 10-year sentence, and the only way to stay out of prison was if she completed a long-term rehab plan at Lovelady Center. After one month there, 
Her caseworker asked her what she could do there that would please God. And that was the moment. I just kind of scooted out of the chair onto my knees and I was like, I gotta do things his way. I, I surrender all. I don't wanna live this life anymore. I don't want this heart. I don't want these eyes. I wanna be transformed. And I was. I asked him to, to forgive me for all the wrong that I'd done, everybody that I had stole from, to, to please just forgive me. I felt like I was looking at, at a new life, like I, like I was looking at a newborn baby who is, who's got a chance at life. That day was my new chance at life. Afterward, Jocelyn says through two months of prayer, God healed her heart and her mind and totally delivered her from her addictions. I've never relapsed, I've never used a drug, and that is nothing but God. And he did it for me and, and he, can, he can do it for anyone. In time, Jocelyn was also able to forgive her father. Forgiving my father felt good because there was no, no more anger there. Um, and that's what, that's what God does for us. He forgives us daily. Today, Jocelyn is newly married with a blended family. She and her husband, Greg, help others who were just like her find true freedom in Jesus through their ministry called The Place of Grace. Jocelyn knows that God can take any mistakes of your past and make you brand new. When you turn your life over to the Lord and, and you totally surrender, He does fill that void. No one can love you like Jesus loves you. God's the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way. What an incredible redemptive story. Now, Jocelyn touches on a couple of things, the addiction, and then her dramatic transformation that she experienced, but also the power of forgiveness. Often when we're hurt or we've experienced some kind of traumatic situation, we hold that inside and it becomes our prison. But we can be free if we release ourselves from the lie. And you know the lie that I'm talking about. We each hear it, but it might be a little different. It's that lie that says, essentially, you don't have any value. You're not good enough. Those are little whispers, not from him who is above. You know, I saw a beautiful church sign in Mississauga, and it simply said, Jesus loves you, no terms or conditions. It was such a great reminder. It doesn't matter what you do in your life. God loves you. His love is bigger than our addiction. It is bigger than our pain. I mean, I cannot imagine going through what Jocelyn did, the hurt, the unforgiveness, the unforgiveness of herself. Yet here she is living a free life where God has redeemed her, not because she deserves it or has worked hard for it. We can't work hard for God's love. God just loves us. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So if this is something you're going through, maybe it's not unforgiveness of someone else, but unforgiveness of yourself. Maybe you're believing those lies that are being whispered into your ear, that you don't matter, that you don't deserve God's love. Please call us, 1-855-759-0700. We've got some great resources for you. One of them is called Free Indeed, and it'll help you guide um, yourself through the situations that you're trying to deal with. And now, Anthony asks God for help to make sure history doesn't repeat itself again. I remember growing up and saying, you know what, I, I don't want to be a drinker. I don't want to be an alcoholic. I wanted to be different. And this is what took my grandma and grandpa. My great-great-grandma was an alcoholic. My great-great-grandpa was shot in a bar. And then I found myself being an alcoholic. I turned it to something that I didn't want to become. Anthony Torres' early childhood came without a storybook start. At the age of six, after his parents divorced, Anthony suffered a significant loss. My mama was 16 years old when she had me. There was always a lot of uncertainty. Being sad, grandma and grandpa had just died in a car accident, killed by a drunk driver, head on. Grandpa died instantly. Grandma died pinned between the cars. My grandpa, to wake up one day and his red truck's not moving anymore, nobody's picking me up for school. For me at that time, it was a lot to process. Anthony moved to a new school a year later. His insecurities grew, as did his teenage drinking. During his senior year of high school, 
Anthony fathered a child. I was angry, angry at God, angry at the world. I drank so much. Just dealing with that pain, dealing with that insecurity, with the hate and the anger and the bitterness that I had. Almost like history was repeating itself. Not only was I a drinker, but now I was a teen dad. I couldn't even take care of myself. How could I take care of a child? Anthony turned to stronger addictions. I started drinking at the age of 14, and I started doing cocaine at the age of 17. It got to the point that when I would drink, I needed to use more cocaine, crystal meth. I tried pills. I even tried heroin a few times, smashing prescription pills and snorting them. Just trying to get a bump in, trying to get a quick high in. He met Sasha at a bar. They began dating. They had a daughter and six years later, a son. Although they remained unmarried, even the semblance of family couldn't change Anthony or his countenance. Like death, like evil, like there was, like I couldn't recognize him anymore. His addiction and his habits had taken over and he wasn't the person that I knew. He became a stranger to us and there was nothing that I could do to make him change. Anthony spent time with a motorcycle group while away from home. We were brothers. We were there for each other. The sense of belonging, to be loved, like that was my excuse. The motorcycle culture, it's what we do, you know, ride around and drink and chasing the girls. And uh, they didn't even care about my consequences. Knowing that I was out there doing all that and my family was at home waiting for me. Sasha put up with this for almost nine years of me back and forth. Oh, I'm gonna get help, I'll change. Nothing ever changed, it just got worse. Anthony's addictions consumed him. It started getting out of control. Sasha was at work, you know, I would get my kids and I would go get my drugs. I saw now that my addiction had become more important than my own family. Finally, Sasha moved out with the kids. Anthony overdosed twice before he agreed to go into rehab. However, he walked out after 11 days and began binging again. I knew that I had a problem. I just didn't want to admit it. I started feeling depressed anxious, feeling suicidal. I had no hope in, in life. And uh, my kids deserved better. Sasha deserved better. Nobody would miss me. And my addictions was gonna kill me. But I wanted to die an addict because I saw no way out. With his house in foreclosure, Anthony moved to Oklahoma to be near his aunt. He passed out one evening while at a party. I um, didn't even know where I was at. When you wake up in your own vomit, it changes things sometimes. Asked my aunt to come pick me up, and she says, I'm going to church, come with me. And I just say, nah, you know, I, I don't even like Christians. I don't even like church. I don't even know if I like God. But I remember showing up to this church. He got up there, and he spoke about a Jesus that I've never heard before in my entire life. He was talking about family, the past, being broken. He was re reading my mail. For once in my life, my heart wasn't hardened anymore. It was softened. Anthony responded. I got up out of the chair and walked towards the front. The walk of defeat, because for once in my life, I had no pride, no ego. God had me right where he wanted me. In the place of brokenness, I fully reached for him who can change my life, and that was Christ. It was that day that I got saved in that church. I began to believe every day he would make me well. Not wanting to drink anymore, I don't want any drugs anymore with hope that people have when they put their faith in Christ. Anthony's been clean and sober since 2010. Knowing that I'm worthy in his eyes when I feel unworthy in my own eyes. He still loves me and wants to be a part of my life. That's the kind of God he is. Sasha and Anthony reconciled and got married. His love was evident before you couldn't feel any warmth or anything from him, and it was the love of Christ in him. I could tell that he wasn't the same. Anthony's change led Sasha to commit her life to Christ. Six years later, they moved back to Anthony's hometown of Alamogordo, New Mexico, to serve as lead pastors at Mountain View Church. I wanna be real and transparent. My goal in life is to change the course from my family. I'm the first pastor in my family. I'm the first author in my family and now restored, loved, and have purpose, going after the heart of a perfect God every single day.
Wow, what a story of transformation. And as Anthony said, he was breaking the cycle of addiction in his family. I mean, this was his goal, was to change the generation. Well, first you have to follow God, and he was the first. All it takes is one person in a family to break the cycle. That's the good news. And one person to surrender to Jesus and his leadership. There's a story in the Bible about really a generational cycle of a nation that was broken after 500 years. It's the story of Esther, actually. See, 500 years earlier, King Saul was told to destroy the Amalekites. They were a nation who hated God and hated his people. But in 1 Samuel 15, verse 9, it says, Saul and the army spared Agag. See, Saul didn't obey God. He didn't do what God told him to do. So you catch up to Esther's time and you hear Haman. Haman, the villainous character in the story, the villain who was out to destroy the nation of Israel, says, for Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agite, the enemy of all of the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had cast the pure, that is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. The cycle is still going on. See, Haman was the enemy of the Jews. And he was a descendant of Agag. And if only Saul had obeyed God. Well, here we have Esther's time. What did it take? Esther and her cousin Mordecai, they broke the cycle. I, Esther said, for such a time as this, she was placed into the king's harem. And she was the difference maker and saved the nation of Israel. You know what? You too can make the, you can be the difference maker in your family. You can break generational curses. How? Follow Jesus. Be the first one to believe. Be the first one to surrender. We have a resource simply called Hope. Give us a call, 1-855-759-0700. We want to pray with you, and we want to see those cycles broken. And now, this is how your generosity helped Alicia find hope after years of battling addiction. What is true love? Alicia Herod thought she knew the answer. But when her parents divorced and an angry custody battle ensued, Alicia's perspective changed drastically. It escalated to a point of my mom um, accusing my father of attempted murder. And um, so <laughs> she was really hurt, you know. She wanted her kids back in her life. The thought. <laughs> my father going to jail for life. <laughs> I think through me. Um, I think that's when I stopped trusting in people and I got really angry. But I didn't know what, who or what. I didn't know what to believe. So it was a tough time for me. Alicia left home searching for a new life and a new image. But becoming the bad girl drew the wrong kind of attention. I craved the attention and the worth and the love so bad that I did whatever I could to get it. The drugs, uh, the sex, the alcohol. You know, it would take the edge off. It would take away the sense of this is wrong. I got to this point where drinking wasn't even enough. Like I needed the combination of drugs and alcohol to be okay. I did you know, something that I thought I would never do. And it, it was, um, I cheated on my boyfriend. And I couldn't tell anybody because I was scared of what would happen to me if I did. I kind of had to make myself not care anymore because I was, the guilt was so bad, I couldn't take it. So that was kind of the moment when um, I lost it. My lowest point was being employed at, at, at the bar, and I would start, you know, drinking halfway through my shift. And then when I would get off my shift, I would obviously be intoxicated. And, um, you know, there would be different men coming in, and they just knew that they could do whatever they wanted. There was a sense of hopelessness because I didn't know how I was going to get out, you know. Her out came from an unexpected phone call from her sister. 
One day, she actually, she called me and she was like, you have to listen to Francis Chan, this message. And I, I put him on, and like I said, like I didn't really understand what he was saying, but I was just bawling, like the whole time, the whole time. And then, so that's when it started. The mornings of waking up, like, is, is this gonna be the day that I call and get help? And so I started praying to God. Like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I know this isn't who I am, and you say you have a better plan for me. And so I need you to show up in my circumstance, you know, and he did. The better plan started to take effect when Alicia was accepted into the Windsor Life Center's recovery program. That is where Alicia found the answer to a question that was buried deep inside. What is true love? My dad drove me up, and as soon as I walked into the doors, it was almost this, like, falling on my knees, you know? Like this, like, oh, like, that's it. Like, I know that's it. Like, it's over. At first, it was crazy because I was like, have I been living so deceived? You know, everything that I was learning and the, the love that I was getting just felt right. Like it was this knowing that this is what you were created for, this is purpose, this is what life is supposed to be. And I had never felt that before. And so I had lived 22 years and like with the wrong idea. <laughs> it's not worth it, there's no comparison, absolutely no comparison to living for the world and living for Jesus Christ. I always say this, but there's a, a God-shaped hole in everybody's heart, and they're always trying to fill it, and that's what I was doing. I was trying to fill it with superficial things, the best clothes, you know, um, attention and um, love from somebody else and um, expectation from all people, and you know, and that is never fulfilling, but that God is what truly fulfills you. And then out of that love and fulfillment, then, you know, you just point other people to Him. And then so they get that love and fulfillment too. There's more to life than this. You were made for more. Today I want us to talk about reflection as a daily practice. Many times we see God teaching us through His Word as well as experiences. You know, day by day, you might miss the signs. Six months down the line, you might hit a breaking point and wonder why. Now, daily reflection is a practice where we take some time at the end of the day, quiet ourselves and think about what gave us life, what gave us energy during the day, or what's straining your life, what's, what's, just, what's just your low point. Once you have those, seeing where is God in that, you know, it's a practice where you can also do that with a family around the table just before dinner. What is giving you life and what's training it? In whatever circumstance you face, God wants you to have victory. It's not too late. Believe that God wants to do a miracle in your life. And if you need to talk with someone who understands, all you have to do is call us at 1-855-759-0700. A prayer partner is waiting to listen and pray with you today. I've certainly been reminded that no matter what you're facing, no matter the addiction, the struggle, there's hope. It's available to you. And we need your help in getting this message out and seeing more people set free from the, really, the power and stronghold of addiction. Won't you become a monthly partner with us? When you join, sign up for Pledge Express. It's the easiest way to ensure every dollar goes to those who need it most. Call today and become a monthly partner and you'll receive our latest CD, Putting on the Armor of God. It's recorded by Pat Robertson with an inspiring reading of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It will really inspire you and help you. Give us a call, 1-855-759-0700. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Get putting on the armor of God. Pat Robertson records the book of Ephesians. Do not let any unwholesome talk 
come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Discover the meaning of spiritual warfare, the importance of unity, the mystery of the gospel, the meaning of the armor of God, and much more. Plus, an exclusive conversation between Pat and Terry. Why is faith so important? When you have that kind of faith, that the power of God is real, then the arrows of the enemy are not going to get to you. Find the wisdom you need to win the spiritual battles and live life victoriously. Putting on the armor of God, available now. Call or go online today. Well, today's a really heavy show. Mm -hmm. But in a good way. I think when we stop and talk about addiction, yeah. unfortunately, a lot of people relate, but we can talk about it in a way that encourages people to get the help they need and to know it's okay to ask for help. Yeah, and that it's hard. If you're struggling, perfect, you're human. Yeah. It's not supposed to be easy. Yeah, but you know, there is help. And I know my son went through, my oldest son went through years of being an addict. I didn't know that. And it affects everyone around them. But when yeah. they, when he was set free, he was a completely different person and continues to be free. Yeah. So I just say that to you because there is hope. Mm -hmm. We have two prayer requests. Uh, Aaron said, please pray for my husband. He struggles with bondage and he wants to be free, but he's not seeking help. So I'm just gonna pray this, Lord, I pray that Aaron's husband would ask for help. I pray that you would do whatever you need to do to ask, for, to just force him to cry out for help, to call to you and to call to others, because I know you're a great rescuer. In Jesus' name, amen. And Parker says, please continue to pray for my daughter to overcome her drug addiction and depression. Oh, that's a tough one. Absolutely, Parker. Dear Lord, we lift up his daughter to you under those sorts of burdens of addiction and depression. It is tough, but God, you are bigger than anything we can go through. We just pray that you will release her of that bondage and that she will experience freedom in you. Amen. I'll tell you, Jesus is a great one to set us free. In fact, it's the only one. Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. And do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mm. You know what always stands out to me in that verse is, you have been set free, well then, live free. Yeah. It can be too easy to go back. Yeah. You know, and we've heard great stories today of people that stayed free. They did. They chose to stay free. Yeah. And you know, you have to just trust God with that. So if you're in the middle of it, keep going. Keep every day believing that God wants you to live free. We love you. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. Tomorrow on the 700 Club Canada, a miraculous healing forces one man to question his faith and addiction is no match for the power of prayer.